اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم لیڈیز ان جنٹلمن پردز ان سسٹرز I welcome you with a universal salutation of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. The meaning of this for our non-Muslim friends in the audience is may the peace, mercy and blessings of Allah, God be upon you all. We at the IPC, London branch, are very honored indeed to have a scholar of the caliber of Sheikh Ahmad Didat in our midst today. But we are also just as much honored to have a dedicated Muslim of the caliber of Dr. Yaqub Zaki in our midst also. He will be the chairman for the meeting and he has taken the trouble to come all the way from Scotland and we appreciate that very much. I'll now hand over to the chairman to continue proceedings. Dr. Zaki. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim In the salat wa salam ala Sayyid al-Mursaleen Ahmed Muhammad al-Mustafa wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma ba'd uh, brothers and sisters in Islam, uh, distinguished guests, in the name of the Islamic Propagation Center, I bid you welcome to today's e events. Uh, before the main feature, which is the speech by Ahmed Didat, begins, we shall have a reading from the Quran, Tilawat al Quran, by Ari Muhammad Farooq. <laughs> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن إبراهيم كان أمة قانتا لله ولم يكن من المشركين شاكرا لأنعمه اجتباه وهداه إلى صراط مستقيم وآتيناه في الدنيا حسنة وإنه في الآخرة لمن الصالحين ثم أوحينا إليك أن اتبع ملة إبراهيم حنيفا وما كان من المشركين إنما جعل السبت على الذين اختلفوا فيه سبحان الله وإن ربك لا يحكم بينهم يوم القيامة فيما كانوا يا 
يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فِيمَا كَانُوا فِيهِ يَخْتَلِفُونَ أُدْعُ إِلَى سَبِيلِ رَبِّكَ بِالْحِكْمَةِ وَالْمَوْعِظَةِ الْحَسَنَةِ وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنُ وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنُ إن ربك هو أعلم بمن ضل عن سبيله إن ربك هو أعلم بمن ضل عن سبيله وهو أعلم بالمهتدين صدق الله العظيم. The basic division in the classification of religions is between ethnic and universal religions. There only are three universal religions in the whole world. Buddhism, Christianity, and Islam. So you don't, in fact, have very much choice. All of the other religions in the world, thousands of them, are ethnic religions, and Judaism is an ethnic religion. I do not think I would be doing the Jews any disservice if I said that Judaism does not claim to be a solution to the world's problems, but only a solution to the problems of the Jews. I shall therefore be very interested to see how the speaker deals with this subject, which of course is of great interest to us, in that uh, Judaism, like Islam and Christianity, is also an Abrahamic faith. I am confident that the speaker will do justice to his subject, because Ahmed Didat is a household name. He is one of the few Muslims to have mastered the discipline and technique of comparative religion. I have long believed that the greatest weakness of the Muslims in their, encounters, in their encounter with members of other faiths is their ignorance of the principles of comparative religion. This you can see any time that you watch a debate uh, between Muslims and Christians or between Muslims, Christians and Jews on television. Uh, invariably, the Muslim speaker covers himself with ridicule and in the process invites not a little discredit on Islam. This is to be attributed to the fact that there is not a single department of comparative religion anywhere in the Muslim world. For this reason, it is all the more important that an individual like Ahmed Didat should have devoted his life to the study of comparative religion. I shall be, therefore be most interested to hear what he has to say, and I have pleasure in introducing to you the speaker. Uh, Ahmed Didat will speak for about 45 to 60 minutes, after which there will be an opportunity to ask questions. Sheikh Ahmed Didat. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الدين إن الله الإسلام صدق الله صدق الله المرآن الزيم Mr. Chairman and brethren I read to you a very brief sentence from the Holy Quran from Surah meaning chapter Ali Imran you owe it to yourself Muslims as well as non-Muslims to get hold of a copy of the Holy Quran I said Muslims as well as non-Muslims the non-Muslims they must know they owe it to themselves that since there are one billion Muslims in the world today they ought to know how their minds are working. 
even as a missionary you want to fight the Muslims an intellectual battle even then you need the book to arm yourself as to what the other person believes and what he his book of authority is and for the Muslim it's also imperative that in this environment English speaking environment that each and every Muslim here ought to arm himself with the English translation of the Holy Quran this particular one I have in my hand is by Abdullah Yusuf Ali this volume has about 2,000 pages and in it how will you find Imran there are 114 chapters and this was only one of the 114 how will you find Imran can anybody tell me index yes you see this particular one here has a very comprehensive index at the back of it what do you want to know our Qari the young man who recited to us so beautifully he was reading from Surah Nahal where will you find Nahal as you go to the index it will tell you chapter 16 around verse 120 he was speaking about Abraham the father of the Jews the father of the Christians and the father of the Muslims I don't know why he chose that verse because there was no communication between me and the reciter as to what he should read but as if he was telling us don't forget Abraham Abraham is the father of the Jews and the Christians and the Muslims he spoken of in the verses he recited that Abraham was a, an upright person going straight towards God and he was not of those who associate other beings with God and in that chapter again in the verses he read the principles of religious preaching he says Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati say invite all to the ways of thy Lord with wisdom wal mau'izatil hasanati and with beautiful preaching wajadilhum billati ahsan and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious chapter 16 ayah number 125 our Qari read it to us as if instructing me as well as you that look these are the principles of religious talk discussion dialogue so in Surah Ali Imran chapter 3 ayah number 19 verse 19 Allah Bari Ta'ala tells us he tells the whole of humanity addressed to mankind so in Naddida in the Allahil Islam most certainly the religion or the deen the way to God acceptable to God Almighty is Islam another place Allah says وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِي غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْهُ وَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ that if anyone chooses a religion other than the religion of Islam he has lost in the hereafter he has no place so what about Judaism what about Christianity when we say that Islam is the only way is there no such thing as Judaism is there no such thing as Christianity no there are such systems then what does the Quran say Allah does not accept anything but Islam only Islam submission to God's will that is what he wants so now I have to satisfy the chairman and you my brothers and sisters how do I justify the statement of the Quran no Judaism no Christianity but Islam I am telling you it's quite easy very easy you see the Jew Judaism came before Christianity and before Islam that is what the whole world will tell you Moses lived long before Jesus and long before the Holy Prophet Muhammad anybody will tell you that but I am asking any Jew you ask any Jew what is your religion and he will tell you his religion is Judaism so I ask him you can ask the Jew 
Is this in your Torah? We in Arabic say Torah. The first five books of Moses. The Jews say is the Torah, meaning the law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. The first five books of the Holy Bible. Is it in there, your Torah? Like what we say, the Quran is to us, the Torah is to the Jew. Is it in your Torah? This word Judaism? He will tell you no. Is it in your Mithna, your second resource of information, your commentaries? He says no. If he knows anything at all about his religion, he'll tell you no. The word Judaism is not in the Torah, is not in the Mithna, is not in the Talmud. So you see now, he's, he's got to say, it's not there. If he said it is, he said, show me, where? He hasn't got it. Where did the word come from? Now we want to know, where did you get it? So, if he knows, he will explain to you that this term Judaism was created, concocted, actually by the non-Jews. You see, the non-Jews in Palestine, they were looking down upon the Jews and they said that the religion followed by the children of Judah in Judea is Judaism. Moses didn't say that. David or Solomon, he didn't utter the word. They'd never heard the term Judaism. Jesus never heard the word Judaism. This was a term invented by people from the outside disparagingly pointing to the Jews that the children, that the religion of the children of Judah in Judea is Judaism. And they liked the term and they adopted it. It is not in the Torah, it is not in the Mithna, it is not in the Talmud. If there is any Jew here who knows any better than that, I would like to hear from him or her. Then what was the religion taught by Moses? We believe that the holy prophet Moses was a true messenger of God. God was directly in communication with him. And whatever he gave in his time to his people was from God. We accept that. But what was his religion? Because he never heard the term Judaism. If Moses was alive with us here today or if on the other side if we have the good fortune of meeting Moses and shaking his hands and if we asked him oh Moses what is your religion since he, had, he didn't hear the term Judaism he can't say Judaism I expect him to say that my religion is a religion of total submission to God's will. A beautiful definition for the teaching of God. My religion is a religion of total submission to God's will. And I'm responding, I'm telling him, I'll tell him that one word for that in the Arabic language is Islam. Islam means exactly that in one word. Islam is a religion of total submission to God's will. So what he was teaching was Islam. Maybe he himself didn't know the term Islam, but that is the definition he's giving of Islam. So, the teaching of Moses was Islam, not Judaism. Therefore Allah says, only Islam is a religion which is acceptable in my sight. No such thing as Judaism or Christianity. Where did Christianity come from? The word Christianity, where did it originate? Did Jesus give his religion, says my religion is Christianity? Did he say I am the Christ? If you know that Christ is a, is a Greek translation of the Hebrew word Messiah. Messiah in Arabic, Masih, means the anointed one. Priests and kings were anointed in consecration to their office. That from now on you are my high priest. From now on you are our king. So the Hebrew word for that is Messiah, one who is anointed. The Greek word for anointed is Christos. But Christos is a bit too long. So they lopped off the os and left with Christ. It is a Greek translation of the Hebrew word Messiah. Jesus never heard the term. He didn't hear the word Christ in his lifetime. <laughs> Believe me. He didn't hear the word Christianity in his lifetime. It was unheard. It's a later on creation. 
And if we meet Jesus in the second coming, and if we have the good fortune of asking him, Oh Jesus, what is your religion? If he said Christianity, we can ask him further. Say, Oh Jesus, tell us what church you belong to. Are you an Anglican? Or a Lutheran? Or a Presbyterian? Or a Jehovah's Witness? Or a Seventh-day Adventist? What are you? What, what church you belong to? Ridiculous, we agree. It's a ridiculous thing. What will he say? What is the name of your religion, O oh Jesus? Tell us. And he will tell us that my religion is a religion of total submission to God's will. One word for that in the Arabic language is Islam. Islam means a religion of total submission to God's will. God says only Islam. Christianity is your creation. Where did the term come from? It is in the New Testament that the enemies of the followers of Jesus disparagingly they pointed to them at Antioch and for the first time they used the term that these are Christians meaning the worshippers of Christ and the Christians liked the term so they adopted it from which we get Christianity Christian Christianity was a term coined invented by the enemies of the followers of Jesus you like the term you take it you see in my country people call other people names they call them names among the whites who are ruling the country the, the majority are English and Africana the Africana calls the Englishman Ruinek Ruinek means rednecks what they are trying to say is that this guy is a softy, he is effeminate, when he goes in the sun for a little while he gets red in the neck. You know, he's a soft guy. That's what he means, when it's a ruined neck, means he's a softy, you know, effeminate chap. We are the boorers. You ask the Englishman, the Englishman says, he is a boorer. Boorer means a farmer. But now, if you ask the Africaner what he is, he says, I'm a boorer, means I'm a farmer nothing wrong with it but when the Englishman calls him a boer he gets offended because when he says boer he's trying to imply that he's backward rustic farmer uneducated barbarian though he himself says I'm a boer but an English speaking person says he is a boer meaning he is backward but they call each other names they call the colored community hot knots means hot and tots they call my people coolies laborers they call the Africans kaffirs but now if you like the term you adopt it no Indian goes around in South Africa boasting I'm a coolie no colored goes around boasting I'm a hot knot no boorer goes around boasting I'm a boorer in the sense of a backward rustic and no Englishman goes around boasting we are ruinecks but if you like the term the choice is yours the Christian made the choice they liked what the enemies call them and they accepted it but the religion of Jesus according to the definition he will give us that my religion is a religion of total submission to God's will one word for that in the Arabic language is Islam and he is a Muslim the Quran describes Jesus as a Muslim his disciples as Muslims what does it mean that they followed Muhammad no they didn't hear the term Muhammad then what does Muslim mean Muslim means one who has submitted his will to the will of God. Anyone who submits his will to the will of God, the Quran says Abraham was a Muslim, Moses was a Muslim, David, Solomon and Jesus were Muslims, Muhammad was a Muslim, and anyone, everyone who submits his will to the will of God is a Muslim. In the Garden of Gethsemane, we see this submission by Jesus, which qualifies him to be called a Muslim per excellence. He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, according to the New Testament, and he tells his disciples, wait and watch, meaning keep guard. And he went a little further, and fell on his face, and prayed to God, said, Oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me, meaning remove the difficulty from me, but not as I will, but as thou wilt. The expression, not, but not as I will, what I want, but as thou wilt. Whatever you want me to, me to do, whatever you want me to go through, oh my Lord, I am prepared to submit. The word for that in Arabic is aslama, submitting. He is a Muslim who has submitted. 
So Jesus was a Muslim, Moses was a Muslim, and if each and every one of us we are prepared to submit to the will and plan of God, you are all Muslims. There is no such thing as Judaism and there is no such thing as Christianity in the official books of the religion. Therefore I say that there is no Judaism and no Christianity. But in the teachings, I say that actually there is no difference. In the fundamental principle of the teaching of Moses, Jesus and Muhammad, there is not an iota of difference, not one dot. I said in the fundamentals of the teachings of Moses, Jesus and Muhammad, even as recorded today in the Christian Bible, there is not an iota of difference. And I prove it to you. We want to know from the Jews. What is the first commandment? The most important thing in your faith. The first commandment. What is it? So he would tell you in the Hebrew language. If he knows. I asked an elderly Jew. I said now do you know the Shama? We say the Shahada. They say the Shama. I said do you know the Shama? He said my wife knows it at home. I said no, no I want to know whether you know it. <laughs> However the Shama is the Shahada of the Jew as given out uttered by the Holy Prophet Moses. The Shama Israel Adonai Elohainu Adonai Echad. Hear O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Some 1300 years after Moses, Jesus Christ is on the scene. He is trying to reclaim his people, bring them out of formalism, ceremonialism, into the truth of God. Make them to accept the letter and the spirit. They are going for the letter of the law. They had forgotten the spirit. And as a reformer among the Jews, we believe as the Messiah, he had come to reclaim them, put them back onto the path. But his preaching, when he preached, the Jews, they thought something otherwise. That this man has brought another religion. Because the way he preached, he didn't preach like the other Jews. The other Jews always said, it is written. Moses said this. It is written, Isaiah said this. It is written, Malak, Jeremiah said this. Everything, it is written, 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 and they quote. Moses, Jesus doesn't speak like that. He says, it has been said by them of old time. Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, on a different level now. Sounds different. I am telling you, you heard that you must not commit adultery. But I say unto you, whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her, had committed adultery with her already in his heart. He's speaking with authority. Not what's written. What is written is there. But now I'm telling you this. You listen to me. Again, he says, it has been said by them of old time, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, resist not evil. He who strikes you in the right cheek, give him the other. It has been said by them of old time, that whosoever puts away his wife, let him give her a bill of divorcement. But I say unto you, that whosoever puts away his wife, save for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery. And whosoever marries her that is divorced, committed adultery. You noted? But I say unto you, but I say unto you, but I say unto you, that created the wrong impression in the hearts and minds of the Jews, that this man has brought a new religion. So they come to him, Gospel of St. Mark chapter 12, Verse 29, they come to him and they says, Master, in the Hebrew language, Rabbi, they were sarcastic. But they showed respect. Outwardly, he said, Master, Rabbi, Molvi Sahib, or Bishop, Bishop Sahib. What commandment is the first of all? And Jesus answers and says unto him, The first is, in the Hebrew language he said, Shama Israel Adonai Elohainu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He repeated word for word what was given by Moses 1300 years before. Without the change of a dot. Meaning that in the fundamentals of faith, no change. 
if Trinity was what he Trinity was what he had come to teach, that was the occasion for him to clarify himself that look, you have been hearing about Shema Israel Adonai Elohim Adonai Echad, but now I'm telling you that for there are three that bear record in heaven: the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That was the occasion, but he didn't say any such thing. In other words, in the fundamentals of faith, no change. Same. Some 600 years later, a Christian deputation comes to the Holy Prophet Muhammad from an area called Najran and they were housed in the mosque of the Prophet for three days and three nights. They ate there, they slept there and for three days and three nights they had a dialogue in the Masjid al Nabawi in the mosque of the Prophet. During the course of the discussion, the spokesman for the Christian poses the question among so many other things. He says, alright now tell us O Muhammad, what is your concept of God? And he doesn't fumble. He doesn't say, well, you see, it's like this and like that and like that. He, so to say, presses his spiritual buttons. There were no buttons to press. I said, so to say. I hope you people, my brothers and sisters from India and Pakistan, they understand my English. It's very difficult for me to say things and then now you go along and say, Muhammad was pressing his buttons, you know, to get his answers. <laughs> I said, so to say, kehne ki baat. You, kehne ki baat, you kehte hain. <laughs> so to say, he presses his spiritual buttons. Asking, oh my Lord, what shall I say? Nobody heard him say that. But so to say, trying to contact the source of all knowledge, the head computer, as the Quran describes, Bal huwa Quranum majidun fi lawhim mahfuz. That this is the glorious Quran from a tablet preserved. Anyone who has a connection with that, any prophet of God would have access to that type of knowledge. Like the end, end terminal of the computer system. You press the button and you get the information. Your flights, timing, this, that, reservation, everything is on. So, what shall I say? Comes the answer from the head computer. From the preserved tablet, saying through his mouth, using him as a mouthpiece. So, say he is God the one and only. Allah Samad, God the eternal absolute. He does not beget and is not begotten. And there's nothing like unto him. A touchstone of theology in four verses. There isn't a theology on earth which these four verses do not cover. Come with any idea of your concept of God. Either with these four verses we accept or we reject. This is the touchstone of theology. Four verses, he uttered them. He said, say he is God the one and only. If the Christians had the presence of mind, they could have asked him, he said, what do you mean say? We want you to tell us and you're saying say. Why do you say say? If I pose the question to you, you know arithmetic. And if you know the 12 time table, I'm asking what is 12 times 12? Answer, anybody know? 12 times 12, what is it? Huh? 144. Right, correct. Six times six? Right. You don't say, say 144. You don't say, say 36, do you? If you said that, I said, what do you say? Say, why must, I'm asking you what is six times six? So you say 36. What is 12 times 12? You say 144. You don't say, say. If you ask Muhammad, if they had asked, why do you say, say? I am asking you why you say, say, he is Allah, the one and only. He says, no, I am told to say that. As if he's only being used as a speaker in the radio. From the head computer, it's being transmitted through him. The, the message comes, say, he is Allah, the one and only. Allah, the eternal absolute. He does not beget and is not begotten. And there's nothing like unto him. And back to normal speech. He was speaking on a certain level, normal communication. Then all of a sudden, he goes into another level, which is not his. 
قل هو الله احد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا احد and back to normal i say you see this is our concept of god my brothers you understand this is so so first words قل هو الله احد say he is allah the one and only moses said Hero Israel the Lord of God the Lord is one Jesus said Hero Israel the Lord of God the Lord is one Muhammad is made to say qul huwa Allahu ahad say he is Allah the one and only What is the difference It's the same message meaning the same thing So in the fundamentals of the teachings of Moses Jesus and Muhammad there is not an iota of difference What was Moses teaching? Islam. What was Jesus teaching? Islam. What was Muhammad teaching? Islam. Submission to the will of God. But today we have some variations. We want to know now solutions to our problems. God Almighty was guiding the children of Israel through Moses. They had been liberated from the Egyptian bondage in the Sinai Peninsula. They were marching from one oasis to another. and they were supposed to do that for 40 years 40 years on and on and on and on and on till the older generation the people who had worshiped the golden calf would perish a new generation would go into palestine that was the philosophy behind marching for 40 years in the desert the jews the children of israel they needed a law a law that would give them quick justice an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth beautiful law in the desert is a beautiful law the adulterer and the adulteress has stoned them to death anybody picking a fire would doing any work on the sabbath day yawm as-sabt saturday kill him stone him to death that's the only language they could understand a rebellious people as moses describes them this is behold a stiff neck people This is Moses the prophet saying a stiff neck means arrogant people he says ye you have been rebellious against the law since the day i knew you this is your tradition from the very beginning since i know you you are like that for such a people you need a law hard law stern law it's a beautiful law the law is made for your needs so eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth you were trying to chase the birds from the field with that old fashioned sling of yours the one that david used and the stone which you and you let go went and damaged somebody's eye so this other jew will go to the judge and says look this fellow here he damaged my eye the law says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth i want to have his eye damaged he broke my tooth break his teeth this was the law nothing wrong with it for a type of people in the desert you need a law that'll give you quick justice no time to waste no lengthy litigations no prisons oh, that you can put the guy in quick justice get rid of the guy and the social character and move on there's work to be done this guy has an adultery he committed adultery your law the jewish law allowed the guy unlimited number of wives why did you interfere with somebody else's wife or daughter you deserve to die There's no prisons in the desert. Leaving the guy in the desert to to die of hunger and thirst was more cruel than getting rid of him by stoning him. Get rid of him, and he becomes an object lesson for others. See what happens? You do the same, you go the same way. This is the philosophy of the law: eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Beautiful law. But laws have a tendency to change characters of people over a period of time. Any law, every law. I come from a color conscious country south africa everything is based on color the south african government in the apartheid policy they graded us into blacks colors blacks colors indians and whites and that part for 300 years almost white man colored man indian man and african man then they divided the black further first is white and black everyone who is a european is white everyone who is not a european is black no man how white you look where do you come from you come from lebanon if you are a muslim you are black if you come from lebanon you are a christian you are white 
If you come from Syria, no man how white you look, whiter than many English people, some Syrians look. You, know. you come from Syria, you are a Christian, you are white. If you are a Muslim, you are black. You come from Cyprus, you are a Greek, you are white, no man how dark you are. The Turk with blonde hair and blue eyes, he's black. <laughs> well, it's, well, look, this is the last laugh you're going to have because that system is now officially abolished in the country. But I'm just giving you history now. This is up to yesterday. This was so. Now, once you have such a law, your mind is working on basis of color. I have had hundreds of whites, Jews and Christians coming to my home. And I enjoy feeding people. Our hospitality, our food, our bhajas and samosas, they lap it up. The white man, the white woman, they eat like mad. I said, in English terminology, they hog it. And when they part, they thank me profusely. The white people are good. They thank you profusely. You know, we enjoyed everything. The chat as well as the food. But subsequently, when they meet me in the street, they say, good morning, Mr. Didas. I say, good morning. I say, how's the wife? I say, she's very fine. How's the family? It's very good. But no white man has invited me to his house for a cup of tea yet. <laughs> so I'm asking the guys, I said, don't you people know anything, such a thing as reciprocation? Huh? You uncultured, barbaric people, you don't know reciprocation? No, no, you know. You know reciprocation. Then how is it that you eat? My food, you enjoy my food, but you don't call me for a cup of tea at your house. Why? I know the reason why. That color consciousness. If he invites me and my family, and I go to the elite, we are all separated into races. The white man living in his area, the Indian in his area, the colored in his area, and the African in his reserves. So if he invites me, and I go with my family, with our, you know, our type of dressing, Pakistani, or Hindustani Muslims, the way we dress, long pants for the ladies, and nice downy covering the body and all that, long dress. And I go and knock at the door, I find number 10 Downing Street there, and I go and knock at the door, and the gentleman or the lady of the house, oh, she opens the door and recognizes, oh, Mr. D, Dad, come in, come in, come in, we are so happy you visiting us. And we get into the house. People were watching. The other whites were watching, somebody watering the garden, somebody doing some hoeing in the garden. They were watching, so where is this coolie going with this family? What is this guy doing around here? You know? And look at that, Mrs. Smith, the way she smiles at this coolie. <laughs> you know, what's going on? And we go inside, maybe a cup of tea, and something little more than a cup of tea, some biscuits and things like that. And a half an hour goes, an hour goes, and tongues begin to wag. They want to know what's going on, what is Mrs. Smith doing with this coolie family? And if any relations of Mrs. Smith or Mr. Smith comes into the house, this Mr. Smith must go, must go out of his way to explain our presence there. It won't be like one English people to another say, look, this is Mrs. Mr. Brown and Mrs. Brown. No, no, no. He must say, look, this is Mr. Didat, and you know, we went to his house, and you know, his hospitality, he fed us with wonderful fruit, and this, he must now, actually, he's apologizing for my presence. My family's presence there. He knows that. So at the back of the mind, the color is coming in. So he eats my food, but he never gives me a cup of tea. Not that he doesn't know. Reciprocation, sociability, he knows all that. But that's only between white and white. Not between brown and white. Difference. So laws have a tendency to change the characters of people. Hitlerite Germany. And land of Goethe and Beethoven, a very cultured nation, a Christian nation, they incinerated six million Jews. Some say it's a fib. I said even 600 is bad enough. On racial grounds, you want to kill a people because they are Jews or they are Indians or whatever. I say unforgivable. Ah, if they commit murder, you can hang him, okay. The gas chamber, okay. He's a rapist, chop off his head, I said okay whether Jew or Christian or Muslim or anybody. But you kill a man because he's a Jew? He didn't choose himself to be a Jew. He was born into the world a Jew in the home of a Jew. He had no voluntary choices. Look, I'll go and be born in the home of a Jew. He didn't decide that. It's just a matter of accident that he happens to be a Jew and you kill him for that. Six hundred and six 
unforgivable on the basis of race. But they say six million, they say let's accept six million. You start wondering, how can such a cultured nation as the Germans, the land of Goethe and Beethoven, do such a horrible, do such a horrible crime? That's very easy, if you are programmed that way. Over a period, these Jews, these are parasites, they are Christ killers, they kill our God. And it has been happening for a thousand years. In Europe, in Russia, in Poland, in France, in Britain, every Easter the Christian goes on the rampage. He says, these are Christ killers, they kill our God. So they kill their men, they rape their women and burn their homes. And they fled. Where do they go to? To Arab lands. And what does the Arab say? Ahlan wa sahlan. Wallah, that's his, that's his nature, that's his culture. Meaning family and play. Just think that you are a member of the family and be at ease. Make yourself feel at home. Thousand years this has been going on. No problem. There was no problem between the Jew and the Muslim. No problem. <laughs> it's a different subject. But I must just end with the sentence that the first time any trouble took place, real trouble between the Jew and the Arab, was when the Arabs heard that the British government things with favor of the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine. Ah, so what is this now? This is my country. For the first time, the Arab realizes that this is my country and this man here, you know, he wants to give my country away to somebody else. So he starts protesting, but he is not organized, he is not educated, so he makes a bad job of it. And he lost it. But between the Jew and the Muslim, no problem. In Spain, the Muslims ruled Spain for 800 years. The golden age of the Jew, ask any Jew, your golden age, the highest that you have reached in civilization and culture, when, they say, under the Muslims in Spain. The golden age of the Muslim was the golden age of the Jew. When we were kicked out, they were kicked out. When the Muslims were kicked out of Spain, the Inquisition, the Jews were kicked out and they came to Britain, they went to France and other places but our suffering was their suffering. Our honor and dignity was their honor and dignity. That is how we live. Religiously there was no problem. No Jew ever killed a Muslim saying kill him because he's a Muslim. No Muslim ever killed a Jew because he's a Jew. Individually things could have happened. Brothers do kill brothers. Cain kill Abel. It happens all the time. But as a race, rights against the Jews, persecution of the Jews, never. Problem starts with 1918, the Belfort Declaration. However, we want a solution today. I'm saying in all humility that the only system, deen, the way of life, that can bring these three warring factions Though we are not at war with the sword and the gun with the Christians, but there is a battle on, battle royal, for the hearts and souls of mankind. The Christians are making tremendous efforts to convert the Muslim world. There are at the present moment 35,000 crusaders raising the dust in Africa. There are 6,000 crusaders in Indonesia. So far, they have converted 15 million Indonesians into Christianity. And by the turn of the century, they want to make Christ Indonesia a Christian nation. They have converted more Pakistanis into Christianity since independence than in the previous 100 years of British rule. They have converted more Bangladeshis into Christianity since independence, since 1947, than in the previous 100 years of British rule. They are going all out. Colonialism is gone. Politically, they can't rule the people anymore. But now, in the guise of religion, they're making a comeback. The war is on. Intellectual battle is on. But what have you to offer? Solution to the problems of mankind. Jesus Christ, in the Gospel of St. John, he says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. I have solution. To the problems of mankind till doomsday, till the end of the world, I can give you those guidance how to solve your problems. Any problem, every problem. But you are incapable of receiving that. Ye cannot bear them now. How be it? When He, the Spirit of Truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. 
for he shall not speak from himself. But what things shall he hear, that shall he speak. And he shall declare unto you the things that are to come. He shall glorify me. He's telling you, honestly. I can give you solutions, but you are like little children. You can't grasp, you don't understand what I'm telling you. Whatever I'm telling you, everything you misunderstand. Everything! That's a tall statement. But the history of that statement is writ large in the Holy Bible. Again and again we read Jesus reprimanding his disciples. He's saying, ye of little faith. You got no faith, no iman. Be iman! Ye of little faith. Ye of little faith. How many times? How many times? Again and again. And he explains to them, as if he's explaining to little children. And they can't seem to grasp the message. So he says, I even yet, without understanding, even yet. And when he's provoked further, he says, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, that's his disciples, not the generality of Jews. He called them other names. You generation of wipers, you whited sepulchres, you hypocrites, you wicked and adulterous generation, you know, you know the law. But he's now telling his disciples, so, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I be with you? I'm saying that if Jesus was a Japanese instead of a Jew, he would have committed that honorable harakiri, suicide. But as a Jew, he can't afford to do that. He loves life. Like we all love life. So he says, how be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not... Now, if I quote this, you see, if you ask any Christian missionary, who is the spirit of truth? He says, the Holy Ghost. He will tell you it's the Holy Ghost. Ask him. You got the Holy Ghost? He said, yes. Your church? He said, yes. Every church and denomination in Christendom claim the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit, they call it. You ask the Jehovah's Witness, you got it? He said, yes. Seventh-day Adventist, you got it. The Anglican, he's got it. The Lutheran, he's got it. The Roman Catholic, everyone. One thousand sects and denomination among the whites of South Africa in my country, they got it. And three thousand among the blacks. Sex and denominations, they got it. What the Holy Ghost? I'm asking, what did the Holy Ghost tell you in 2000 years? Which Jesus already didn't give it to you in so many different words. Give me one. Only one new thing, new thing. Jesus, I have yet many. I said in English, many means more than one. He will guide you into all truth. I said all in English means more than one. I don't want more than one. I want only one. And for 40 years I'm asking, learned men of Christianity gave me one new thing that the Holy Ghost gave you in 2000 years to any church. Any church. Bring it, I want to hear. There is it. I said, we have problems. We have problems. The biggest problem is race. In the world today, race, racism. We are all racist. I said, all, we are all racist. Nobody is exempt from this devilishness, this sickness of racism. No man, how much we boast. We Muslims might say that we are the least racist. But you can't say we are pure from that sickness. Nobody is pure. The Jews said we are the children of Abraham. We are the children of David. The rest of the world, we are the children of Israel. The rest of the world was Goim. What is Goim? Ask him. Gentile. What is Gentile? Unclean. Filthy, dirty, uncircumcised people. You. Pig eaters. You. That's how he is. The rest of the world. The Arab, you know what the Arab said? He says we are the Arabs. You know what it means? We are an eloquent people. You see, in my language, the Arab says, I can give you a hundred synonyms for a sword. I can give you a hundred synonyms for a horse. In your language, how many can you give? Maybe half a dozen. Half a dozen for a horse. Half a, half a dozen for a sword. He said, you see, compared to me, you are dumb. So he says, you are ajam. Ajam means dumb. We are the Arabs, the eloquent people, and the rest of the world is dumb, like animals. That's his, that's, that's his racism. And my people in India, we say we are the Aryans. We are the master race. And the rest of the India are achut, untouchables. Ask the British, they'll tell you something about themselves as I can say that. Ask the Germans, they'll tell you something as I can say that. This is man, any man, every man. 
sickness. That we are all sick. Now, how to eliminate this sickness? You see, it's very easy for anybody to talk about the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. Very easy. There is but only one father, our creator, Lord and cherisher, God Almighty. And we are all his children. That's talk. 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 How do you implement it? System. You require a system. Talking is easy. Preaching is easy. How do you implement that brotherhood? Judaism hasn't got it. Christianity hasn't got it. Jesus Christ himself, he discriminated in his own time. He says, I am not sent but under the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I have only come for the Jews. He is telling his disciples, go ye not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but go ye rather unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's what he did. Himself in his lifetime, he never preached to a single non-Jew. In his lifetime. A Greek woman, she had a problem. She, her daughter was suffering some incurable sickness. So she brings her daughter to him. He said, Master, heal my daughter. So he turns his face away. She goes on the other side. He said, Master, please. Drowning men clutches at straws. Drowning women do the same. My daughter's life is at stake. Please help her. So the disciples said, look, this woman, she won't let us, let us go. She'll pester us, our life out of her. Heal her daughter. So he says, do not throw the bread of the children to the dogs. These Greeks are dogs. My children are the Jews. My, what I brought, the spiritual blessing. He's not talking about bread. He's talking about spiritual blessings. Goodness, you see, that is for my children, the Jews. These rest of them, the Greeks and the Romans and all are dogs. You mustn't throw, do not throw that which is holy into dogs. Do not throw pearls before swine. I'm asking who are the dogs and who are the swines? The non-Jew. That's his teaching. Now man, you say, now we open our churches to all races now. After 300 years in South Africa, for the first time, they say, now we open our churches to all people. After 300 years. For 300 years, you can't have a black bishop. You had to rule every Christian. In Indonesia, in India, wherever the white man must rule. You held the reins. Because you were racist. Now, Jesus had given it to you. He said, no, my children and the dogs are separate things. In his lifetime, now this woman, she is a drowning person. Her daughter's life is at stake. So she says, Master, even the dogs have crumbs from the master's table. That was too much for him. So he said, give her the crumbs. And the daughter was healed. The crumbs of the blessings. His food, his bread, was for his own children, the Jews. But I say system, even whatever you claim, you require a system to change the hearts and minds of people. Now, the Muslim is the only guy who has the system. Five times a day, the Mu'azzin, the caller goes on top of the minaret and he shouts in a loud sonorous voice, it's Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. It's Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest. He repeats it four times. It's Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. He said, I bear witness that there is no other object to worship but Allah, God Almighty. He's the only one who deserves to be worshipped. He repeats it twice. He said, Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. He said, I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. He is not God. He is not his son. Don't make a mistake like the others have done. They made the prophets into gods. They made the heroes into gods. Don't you do that. The Muslim is warned. And Alhamdulillah, this sickness hasn't got us yet. Of worshipping Muhammad as a god. Hmm? There is isn't such thing. He repeats it twice. Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. If you accept these two fundamentals, that there is but one God and Muhammad is the messenger. What is the message? He continues, Hayya ala salat, he says, come to prayer. Hayya ala salat, he says, come to prayer. Hayya ala falah, he says, come to success. Because this is real success. That you remind yourselves about your duties and obligations towards your creator and your duties and obligations towards your fellow human beings. If you want to be successful, there is no other way. And he winds up the call by saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allah is still the greatest, Allah is still the greatest. Whether you come or you don't come, you are not going to lower him in his exaltation, in his majesty, in his glory, he will ever remain supreme. And the final words of warning, the Mu'azzin gives, the caller gives, 
ke la ilaha illallah that there is no other object of but of worship but allah you can carry on worshiping your man gods your women gods your money gods but remember this that the only one who deserves to be worshiped is allah and the muslim hearken to the call Holy Prophet Muhammad has said that when you stand up for prayer, you must not leave gaps for the devil to get in between you and your brother. This devil that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was talking about was not the guy we see in our art galleries. In my country, in Durban, there's in the art gallery there's a huge painting by some great artist. You see in that painting a beautiful woman with wings, well proportioned. and she's got a wand in her hand and she's directing the devil to go to hell and in the picture you can see the devil flying off ready complexion red 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 with horns and sharp ears and a tail with a barbed hook and you see the hell fire in the distance in the picture you can see all that <laughs> i said muhammad wasn't talking about that a devil like that with a tail with a barbed hook i said if you see one you run for dear life me too i run for dear life <laughs> you stand there and and reason with him You listen to him never devil comes in a beautiful form wallah makes things appealing to you so you get caught he comes in that form you run <laughs> muhammad wasn't talking about that he was talking about you yourself he was talking about you your racial pride your arrogance your riches i am white he's black i am rich he's poor that devil must not be allowed to come in between you and your brother no gaps left This is what Muhammad five times a day we get together and we finish off our prayer go and watch them at in the mosque sometimes prayer time ask the muslim friends if you know i say look we want to see how you people pray and you watch when they finish off they say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah so peace and blessings of god to everybody to the right of me assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah so peace and blessings of god to everybody to the left of me when i did this i see an african there When I did that, I see a Chinese here. When I did it again, next time I see a white man there. Next time I see a colored guy there. I see an Eskimo this side. So in my heart and mind, this is my brother. This is my brother. This is my brother. This is my brother. System, system of eliminating this racism. We are still racist. The sickness is there; it hasn't left us. But the system makes you the least racist. I'm st still ashamed to say that we are not. free from the sickness whether you are a pakistani or you are a bangladeshi or you are a punjabi or you are a turk or you are an arab i say we are all sick the system is there to eliminate this feelings of racism out of you then on a friday bigger gathering then once in a lifetime you go for pilgrimage and there you see this is the chinese muslims and the guy from ethiopia is black as coal my brother and the guy from turkey with blonde hair and blue eyes my brother i didn't imagine all this to me all muslims are so look like me now i see a ethiopian is a muslim and the madrasi is a muslim and the chinese is a muslim ah my brother my brother my brother a system of bringing people together and working out this poison of racism alcohol the only system on earth which says don't touch that abomination is islam allah says in the quran ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu wa sa'u ju bilayh inna al khamru mustatli intoxicants wal maysir and gambling wal ansab and fortune telling wal azlam and idol worship rizum min amal shaitan are an abomination of satan's handiwork fajtanibuhu la'allakum tuflihun it's a shan such abomination that you may prosper four evils one stroke slash them all I didn't know time flies so fast in London. <laughs> Mr. Chairman and my dear brothers and sisters, I would rather leave this meeting open for questions. Maybe you have something you want to ask me. But otherwise I can keep you here till midnight. I won't be deriving any pleasure out of that no will you. I now leave this meeting as the chairman dictates or explains to you how this system of questioning will work. Wa akhiru dawana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.
Uh, now, I see again we have a full house here, several thousand people, and a thousand people invariably produce no less than one million questions. So to control the anticipated avalanche, I'm going to call on Mr. Ibrahim Lokat, who will explain to you the format of the question and answer session. Mr. Lokat. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Before I go on to the format of the session on the questions, on behalf of Mr. Ahmad Didat and myself, I would like you to know that we are simply overwhelmed with the marvelous hospitality and the warmth and the friendship that you people have extended to us during our stay in London. And tonight, looking over this hall at this marvelous crowd, the familiar faces, some who have followed us through different lectures. I see people like the Imam, Sister Atiyah, and some people up there. Even if I can't see you, I can feel you, and I know you are there. And believe me, when we go back to South Africa, we will take your good wishes and warm feelings with us, and we want to thank you for that. We also want to thank the IPCI London, IPCI Birmingham, and really everybody who has assisted us and will continue to assist us. <coughs> Firstly, there are a few simple rules to observe. All questions must be confined to the subject of the lecture that you have just heard. I think that's fair, you will agree that the questions that you would like to put to the speaker should be confined to the lecture that you've just heard. Secondly, in the interest of giving everybody an opportunity, we will allow one question per questioner. Thirdly, please keep your questions concise and brief, and I'm aware that some of us will try and make a statement in the guise of a question all I say there is watch out, I'll disqualify that. We don't want a debate. If you would like to have a debate, I am sure the Acton Council will be happy to hire out this hall for you, to you, and we will come and hear you have a debate or make your statement. Please confine it to a question, not a statement. Also remember, you will not always get the answer that you think you desire or you would like to hear because it only needs two people to have a variance of opinions. You are entitled to your opinion, so is Brother Didat to his opinions. Also note it will be impossible to answer every single question due to the number of people attending, so at a certain point we will cut off. Please accept my apologies if you didn't make it with your question. Lastly, all questions will be put through to me, upon which I will repeat the question so that everybody up there hears what the question is and the speaker will take the question. Okay, if that's it, thank you for your patience. To the questioners, I also ask you to bear with us while you will get a reply for asking you to wait your turn. So please bear with us, we'll start off with the first question. Please. Uh, brother, brother, I could do that. Could you please clarify the point that not a single word of the Bible was written at the time of Jesus Christ. I mean, during his lifetime, not a single word was written at that time. I mean, it took about 1,000 years to write the whole Bible, and it took about 40 authors to write it. So, no, it's, not, it's not only it's not a God, God's word, it's not even Jesus' word. That's so, what I mean. So, is your question is, is the Bible, or is the Bible Je the word of Jesus? Yes. It's not a question, it's more a No, no, we said a question. All right. Second so, clarification, yeah, of that the Bible wasn't written at the same I mean, at the time of Jesus Christ. The gentleman once a point clarified is that the Bible was not written at the time of Jesus. He would like Amadida to clarify that point. This is a commonly accepted fact that in the lifetime of Jesus, not a word was written. 
there was no such thing as the gospel of saints mark matthew luke or john or paul nothing at all nobody ever penned anything the oldest manuscripts the christian world has they go to some three centuries after jesus written form three centuries but they say historically they can say some of them were written some 80 years after jesus some of them 100 years after jesus but the manuscripts they have in the hands is 300 and 600 years old see the authorized king james version of the bible and the new version are based on the ancient manuscripts that is 600 years after jesus the new version and the king james version are based on manuscripts some 600 years after now they are able to have access to older manuscripts the revised standard version is now based on the most ancient which is about 300 years but in the lifetime of jesus not a single word was written nor did he write it nor did he dictate to anybody to write a word thank you for having it confirmed next question please in the Bible by Jesus during the time of Jesus? The question is about the Gospel of St. Barnabas. There is a Gospel of St. Barnabas. The manuscripts are in the Vienna Museum. It was translated in 1907 by Lonsdale and Laura Rag in Britain. The Gospel of St. Barnabas. Now in that Gospel, the Holy Prophet Muhammad is mentioned by name. And everything that the Muslim believes seems to be confirmed in the Gospel of Barnabas. But now, if we produce that as a proof of our claim, that Jesus did mention the coming of our Prophet by name, the Christian world don't know anything about the Gospel of Barnabas. They would tell you that this is a fabrication. Now, you will be forced to start proving the Gospel of Barnabas to the Christian. At the end of an hour, and I was exercised, the Christian can still say, look, but I don't know Barnabas. What you do? It's a wasted exercise. You see, if you can show, Allah Bari Ta'ala wants you to follow a certain system. In the Holy Quran, he tells you, وَقَالُوا and they say, لَنْ يَدْخُلَ الْجَنَّةَ إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَ هُدَنَ وَنَسَارَ the Jews and the Christians, they say to the Muslims, that you Muslims will never, never enter heaven. There's no salvation for you. Unless we become a Jew or unless we become a Christian. In answer to that, Allah says, Tilka amani yuhum, that this is the wishful thinking, vain desires, hallucination. Qul, tell them how to burhan. Produce your proof. In kuntum sadiqeen, if you are speaking the truth, let us have a look at your certificate. Your diploma that entitles you to heaven and destines us to hell. Let us have a look. That is the principle. And they have produced it, the Bible. That's the proof, the Burhan. So now, if you can prove your case, as I was trying to do to you, that Jesus mentioned the coming of our Nabi Karim Sazan. In his words, I gave you. And we can analyze that prophecy further. There are books will be available on the subject. Muhammad, the natural successor to Christ. But now, this is the way. Show him in the book that he's holding in his hand. You say, Barnabas, I don't know Barnabas. I haven't seen Barnabas. You say, no, I'll produce it. But this, I don't know. I don't want to know Barnabas. Show me Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deut so you speak to him on that basis there is a better chance for you to prove your case to him than to talk about Barnabas so uh, my suggestion is for your own entertainment very good Barnabas is very good but don't waste your time in trying to convince the Christians with Barnabas okay Jazakallah yes brother Yet, when I 
The question is that Mr. Didat has made a lot of references to the Bible. The brother says when he quotes the Bible, the brothers do not accept that those quotations. You see, what I'm quoting you now are words, for example, if you have a red letter Bible. I think you know, I think you are a Christian, and as such you know what is a... Huh? You were, right? Uh, the Christians have what is called a red letter Bible. Red letter Bible, everything that Jesus spoke is in red. In the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and throughout the 27 books, everything that Jesus spoke is in red. So he says, right, if this is what you say he spoke, I'm quoting Jesus to you. But there are other things besides, they do not hold the same value in our sight. In the sight of the Muslim. So now there will be arguments and debates. We are now arguing on interpretations. Which we have said, let's reason. Let us reason. But now, what do we think of the Bible? What do we believe about the Bible? There is a book available in the foyer. Written by me. Is the Bible God's word? In a nutshell, I will tell you there. That there are three types of evidences in the Bible. Which any sensible man can see. In the Bible, you will find the word of God. God's word. For example, if I quote you from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse 18, God says, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. You ask any Jew, who is this I? He says, God. Ask any Christian, who is this I? He says, God. As it also appears to me that God is talking. Or in the book of Isaiah, God says, I, I am God and there's none else. I am God and there's none like me. You ask any Jew who's talking, he says God. Ask any Christian who's talking, he says God. And I have no hesitation in accepting it, that this is God's word. That's one type of evidence you'll find in the Bible, where we have no hesitation in accepting it. Then there is another type of evidence which I quoted you. Jesus says, but I say unto you, but I say unto you, who is this I? Jesus. So we say that's the word of the prophet. Prophet of God. Then there is another type of evidence. Where if reason reads in the New Testament, while he, Jesus, was going forth into the way, he saw a fig tree in the distance with leaves. Happily, he came up to it, wanting to find figs thereon. But when he came, there was nothing but leaves. Whose words are they? Not God, not Jesus, but an eyewitness or a ear witness. Or somebody speaking from hearsay. So I said, we in the house of Islam, we also have similar evidences in our religion. We have the Quran, the word of God. Then we have the books of Hadith, traditions, sayings of the Prophet, separate volume. It's not to be mixed with this. Then we have the writings of our philosophers, Imam Ghazali, Ibn Taymiyyah, and so on and so on. Again, not on the same level as the word of the Prophet. Then we have also our Arabian Nights, which you know where they belong. See, the fairy tales among the Arabs. They spoke around the campfires of filthy, dirty, pornographic uh, stories. So, there are different, different types of evidence, but we are the most fortunate of all religious groups that our stories are all in separate compartments. And we do not equate the words of the Prophet with the words of God, and we don't equate the words of a wise man with the words of the Prophet. And of course, the Arabian Nights, we know where they belong. Can you see? So, the, unfortunately, the Christian and the Jews have not been able to separate their books. So the word of God is in the book, the word of the prophet is in the book, the word of the historian is in the book, and many things besides. Which is very difficult for people to read to their, to their mother or sister or daughter, or even to the girlfriend, if she is a very straightforward person. So this is how we evaluate. The book is available, there are 50 pence each. Two for any two for a, a pound and if you feel that's too much you write to me i'll send you free from south africa but you know uh, don't be a beggar that mentality don't have a beggar mentality this is man you got a pound said come give me any two pick them up and take them and the quran is also available two thousand pages for six pounds anybody you have access to this they are available in the foyer right. Thank you. pleasure next question please Okay. Are you a Muslim? Huh? Look, I had the guys playing tricks on me in Pakistan. 
And since then, I have vowed. Did you understand my talk in English? Some, no good. Then there's no sense in me wasting time. If you understood some, now I have to start re-explaining to you again. If you understood it, then you can ask the question in English, if you understood. If you didn't, it's just too bad. I'm sorry. You'll have to get the speech translated by somebody. No Urdu. No good, small or big. If you understood my English, you have a right to ask me. If you didn't, please don't waste the people's time and my time. Thank you, brother. I Never, huh? Some of the lectures. In English, can you ask? In English. Can you ask the question in English? You are welcome. Go ahead. Uh, he was describing that uh, between Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, there is no difference in basic teachings. If there is no difference, then why Christian they follow Islam or why Jews uh, they follow Islam? I mean, why don't they? The question that the brother has put in is that the speaker said throughout the evening that there was no fundamental difference in the teachings of Islam, Christianity and Judaism. If that is the case, or that being the case, why doesn't all three religions then, or, or why doesn't the Christians and Jews follow the teachings of Islam as prescribed, by, as prescribed in Islam? Quite in order, quite in order. You see, we are the children of our environment programming. In the fundamentals, as I proved to you, no difference. Moses said, one God. Jesus said, one God. Muhammad said, one God. Now, in the interpretations, people differ. You see, you ask the Christian, how many gods are there? He'll tell you one God. What is this God like? Then he says, there are Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He believes in a triune God, three in one. You say, did Jesus teach that? No. Where did you get it? You say, well, there is a verse in the Bible, first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7, where it says, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That is the clearest statement on the Trinity in the Bible of the Roman Catholics and the Protestants. But if you take any modern translation done by the Christian scholars today, the revised version, the revised standard version, the American standard version, the new world translation, every translation has thrown this verse out as a fabrication. But prejudices die hard. You see, once you accept, if the Christian accept that, look, this was, it is not there. Who took them out? Not the Muslims, not the Jews. The Christian scholars, 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 52 cooperating denominations in the revised version of the Bible, they said it's a fabrication and they threw out the verse on the Trinity. But the common man, the lady, the priest, they'll still keep on preaching it. Because if they say, yes, there is no such thing in the words of Jesus, and even in the Bible there is no such statement, this is a concoction, immediately they'll become Muslims. They'll lose their businesses. If you lose all your church going members, what are you going to do with all your cathedrals? So the thing is prejudice, vested interest, business, is, it's a thing that you know you hold on to your cows, your milking cows. Anybody, once you have your milking cow, you don't want to let it go. So this is the way of keeping the people in. But any reasonable person, go to your book, analyze it and you'll find there is no such thing as the Trinity in the Bible. Okay? Thank you. Can I ask you another question? Thank you, brother. One question. And I think that was a good question in English too. <laughs> Just before you put the question, I must apologize once again to the questioners for the length of the reply, but I'm sure the audience appreciates that. Mamu, I hope that queue is not expanding. If you can keep a tight rein on that, I'd appreciate it because time is getting on. Yes, brother. Wa alaikum <laughs> salam. The question is that the speaker deals with the racism at length during his talk. Would the speaker comment on racism? 
There are so many problems, but racism is one of the main ones, like in South Africa, or the rest of the world. You go to Japan, you go to India, race, race, race. So it is a very big problem. And uh, Islam offers a solution. Alcohol is another big problem. See, surplus women is another problem. No, they are all problems, each from his point of view, say, well, this, the gravest is this one here. You know, we can't find husbands for our daughters. What do we do? The other guy says, look, our children are drunkards. You know, what do we do? So these are all problems. But among them, racism is also one of them. It depends on you now, where you put it in the slot. Number one, number two, number three, number four. It's left to the people to decide. But they are all problems. Jazakallah. question is, could Mr. Didad describe the, the comments in the Jewish Talmud, is that right? Comments on the Jewish Talmud and the historical background of the Jewish Talmud and its attitude, the Jewish attitude to non-Jews or Gentiles for non-Jews. You see, the book of authority that we are dealing with, the one we are familiar with is the Holy Bible. And what you want to prove, everything is here. You want to know the Jewish Talmud, you go and find a synagogue. You know what's a synagogue? A Jewish church, a synagogue. And go and ask the rabbi, ask the rabbi there about the Talmud. I know it is available in English. Whether he has it or not, I don't know. I don't possess one, though I have seen quotations from it. So the best thing is, for that information, you go to a synagogue and ask a rabbi, and he'll be able to help you, inshallah. Next question, please. My question is in reference to the concept of remnant church. Sorry, the police speaker. Remnant church. 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 Rem
The speaker has posed the question that in the Quran, the people who follow the religion of Moses and Jesus are referred to as, as people of the book. And in the Quran, there are references to unbelievers and disbelievers. The, the questioner asks Mr. Didat's opinion on this terminology that's used from people of the book and disbeliever and unbeliever. Did I get that right, sir? I think we'll have to tell our brothers and sisters they are there that we'll have to close by half past eight because we can carry on till ten o'clock and people are, you know, waving the fans and there's a limit to anything. Half past eight, whatever we can deal with and we can't continue till nine, ten because it can lead us to ten o'clock and I don't think it's fair to the audience to keep them seated in this heat for all the time. I think that's a fair point from the speaker. I apologize for that. We will go as fast as we can, but when we come to 8.30, we will cut off. So if you are at that cut off mark, I'm sorry. With regards to the Ahl al-Kitab, the Holy Quran speaks about the Jews and the Christians as Ahl al-Kitab, meaning people of the book, meaning a learned people, people with the scripture. This is what they were boasting. In the time of the Prophet, they boasted that we are a learned people. We have a book. We have a revelation given to us. And you Arabs are barbarians, illiterate, ummi. You haven't got a prophet to your credit. You haven't got a book to your credit. As such, we are learned and you are unlearned. So Allah Bari Ta'ala addresses them in those very respectful terms. Ya Ahlul Kitab, O people of the book, Ta'ala come ila kalimatin sawa'im baynana wa baynakum. That we come to common terms as between us and you. Come, let us get onto a common platform. This is how Allah speaks about the Ahlul Kitab. Ahlul Kitab means Jews and Christians. With regards to the unbeliever and disbeliever, this is a choice. Some translators call those who don't believe in Allah, the mushriks, unbelievers. Some say disbelievers. Technically, what is the exact meaning of disbeliever and unbeliever? I think Dr. Zaki, if you meet him afterwards, he might be able to explain to you. I have no knowledge. In this, that English is a bit too high for me. You know, you say, now nah, disbeliever means this quality of an uh, uh, unbeliever, and this unbeliever means this degree. That type of knowledge I haven't got. So this is the explanation. Ahl al-Kitab means Jews and Christians, unbelievers mostly referring to the Mushriks, those who didn't believe in Allah. Thank you. Next question please. sister I saw your hijab from out here and I appreciate you waiting so long in the interest of giving as many people an opportunity as possible I'd appreciate it if you keep your questions brief
the question that's posed is that often uh, Muslims are accused of putting the best examples forward in their discussions with Christians when in fact the society that it should be posed to is a secular society and not a Christian society. What do they say? You ask any of the secular people in your country, when they fill up the census forms, religion, what do they say? Judaism? Or do they say Islam? Or they say Hinduism? What do they say? Christian. So they say they are Christian, whether they are secular or religious. And the fact is that there is a problem of alcoholism among the people. There is a problem of surplus women. There are four million more British women in your country than men. If every man in England got, and um, Scotland and Wales, they all got married, there will still be four million women who can't get husbands. Now we say, look, Islam has a solution to your problem. You don't like it, you laugh at us. I said, the laugh is on you. The, the solution to the problem, Islam offers you. America has 7.8 million women, more than men. If every man in America got married, 7.8 million women can't get husbands. And of the manpower they have, 25 million are gays, sodomites. That makes 32 million women can't get husbands. Then 98% of the prison population is men. Still so many men out of circulation. You see, your problem is getting compounded. So he says, now look, Islam as a, as a natural religion, Allah bari ta'ala, God Almighty in his mercy, he gives you a solution. The solution is, Allah says, marry women of your choice by twos and threes and fours, but if you cannot do justice between them, marry only one. The only religions book on the face of the earth which has the statement marry only one is the Quran. There is no such statement in the Holy Bible, in the Bhagavad Gita or the Ramayana, nowhere. Marry only one. This is a solution to your problem. You have a laugh on us? I said the laugh is on you. So these are just words, the technicalities, the finest point. This is the solution, the medicine. If it is good enough for you, take it. If you don't, you simmer in your soup. Jazakallah. Next question, please. My question is concerning your statement. There is no difference between Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. The question is this. As you know, in Judaism, Moses, in the Torah, when he brought a sacrifice offering before God, always a blood sacrifice, always a lamb. You know the story of Abraham. Then Jesus pointed out, uh, also said, by the blood, there is only forgiveness. Uh, my question is, where is blood in Islam? Do Muslims believe that the blood atones, or do they believe, as I have read so many times in the Quran myself, that they believe in works? Thank you. We get the question, I'll just summarize it in the interest of brevity. The concept of blood in the Muslim society as opposed to good works and good deeds. Where is the concept of blood in Islam? You see the idea of blood. The Jews had two goats for your sins. One the scapegoat and one for sacrifice. One, they loaded the sin on the goat and left it in the wilderness to take away your sins and the other for the expiation for your sins, slaughter. And this carried on till Jesus and still the thing is the Christian continues. Though he doesn't sacrifice a sheep or a goat, he feels that Christ has fulfilled that. Right. But now the parable that Jesus gives, he doesn't say that. See, that you sacrifice an animal and it takes away your sins. He didn't say that in the parable. If you remember the parable of the prodigal son, Jesus spoke about the prodigal son. That a father had two sons. One of them chose at one stage, he said, look daddy, give me what belongs to me, my inheritance, and I want to fend for myself. So father gives him whatever ought to belong to this son, prodigal we call him now. So he goes out to a far off country, he squanders his wealth, whatever was given to him, and he falls into bad company, in the gutter, drinking, adultery, whatever, filth and dirt, and in that condition he realizes that he would have been better off with the father. So he returns. 
back to the father. And the father sees him from afar. You should know the Bible. He sees him from a distance and he runs towards the son and he embraces his son and he cries. He said, this my son was dead, is now alive. He was lost, is now found. And he tells the other brother, he said, sacrifice the fatted calf as a celebration of the incoming of the, of the prodigal. Now who is the father and who are the sons in the parable? The father is God. Ask any Christian learned man, who is he talking about? Father is God. The sons are one like you, one like me. In other words, you are a good guy, always prayerful and all that. The other guy has drifted off and he chooses to come back. What does the father say? He doesn't say, you who you squandered my wealth, I want you to sleep with the pigs and look after my, <laughs> my pigs for seven years before I get you into the house. Father doesn't do that. The father is prepared to sacrifice his own, not the son. The punishment should go to the son. So this is the law of God, that if you make a sincere repentance, you repent sincerely, you want to come back to God, God accepts you with open arms. He will not punish you. He needs no blood. Not the blood of a man or of a lamb. In the house of Islam, the Quran tells us that neither the flesh nor the blood of the sacrificed animal reaches him. But it is your piety. What goes in to making the sacrifice? Your. So if I understand, you say works is what the Muslim No, no, what? No, works also. Without spirit is a dead thing. You do the works, let's say you pray 50 times a day, you have more, your, your mind and soul is not there, you're wasting your time, you fast in the house of Islam. When you fast, we don't eat and we don't drink from certain time to certain time. But at the same time, the guy is backbiting, he's slandering. So the Holy Prophet Muhammad says, you're wasting, you're only starving yourself. But isn't that a major difference? A big one? Isn't that a major difference? Oh yes, big difference. What are you doing? In other words, now your heart and mind and soul must be in what you're doing. Without that, just formality won't take you to heaven. Formality of sacrificing sheep, goat or cow, that doesn't take anybody to heaven. Because the Quran says, neither the blood nor the flesh of the sacrificed animal reaches him. But it is your piety, what is in you. says Jesus did not use force to promote his religion did Muhammad use force to promote his religion force. the sword not force I'll clarify the sword to get people into the fold of his religion This is a very common accusation, allegations against Islam, that Islam was spread at the point of the sword. That's a commonest fabrication that is invented against Islam. Look at history. One man against the whole world. Thomas Carlyle, a British. In 1840, he delivered a series of talks in London. And he defends Muhammad, Thomas Carlyle, about the sword. One of the greatest thinkers of the past century, a British, an Englishman, an Anglican. He said, the sword indeed, with regards to the charge of the sword, he said, the sword indeed. But where will you get your sword? He said, every new opinion at its beginning is precisely in the minority of one. When you start a movement, there is no political party. There is no council of churches to, be, to create a bishop or a pope. There is nothing like that. You know the history of Muhammad. Starting from the minutest beginnings. By the time he's six, his mother dies. Before he's born, his father died. He's doubly often by the time he's six. He's looking after his uncle Abu Talib's goats. At the age of 40, for the first time, he declares his mission. And persecution. If you know the history of the early Sahabas, the companions, persecution. 
to such an extent that twice they had to flee to Abyssinia, the Muslims. Then Muhammad had to flee from Mecca to Medina. Where is the sword? In other words, he must force the Quraysh and say, you, accept Islam on the chop of your head. Where is the sword? He said, every new opinion at its beginning is precisely in the minority of one. In one man's head alone, there it dwells as yet. It is one man against all men. That he take a sword and try to propagate with that will do little for him. One man against all men. The whole world. The man takes a sword and says, hey, all of you, like me now, if I had a gun, so all of you except Islam. Say, la ilaha illallah. What is it worth? What is it worth? Rubbish. He says, first get your sword, meaning you need people to accept, voluntary acceptance. The Quran says, la ikraha fi deen. There is no compulsion in religion. It's worthless. You are a non-Muslim, I take it. We are a majority here. So we gather around you and say, now come on, accept Islam <laughs> or we put a knife through you. What is it worth? Rubbish. But this is the child, look at history. Now, while he's in Medina, the Quraysh, the Mushriks, the idol worshippers, they come to, towards Medina and there's a battle at Badr. The guys came 200 miles, the Muslims came out a few miles to meet them. The second battle, Uhad, Medina itself. Third one, the battle of the trench. Who is doing the fighting? With regards to Jesus, now with regards to Saul, in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 19, verse 27, Jesus says, For those my enemies, who would not that I should reign over them, bring them hither and slay them before me. Luke 19.27, check it out. For those my enemies, who are his enemies, anyone, he doesn't want Jesus to rule him, he said they are his enemies. Bring them hither, bring them here, and slay them in my sight, kill them. Then, at the Last Supper, if you remember, he's telling his disciples, do you remember I told, sent you out on your mission of preaching and healing? And when I sent you out, I told you, that you must not carry no spare shoes, no purse, no sticks. Right? Mm -hmm. I said, right. Did you lack anything? They said, no. But now I tell you, those of you who's got no swords must sell their garments and buy them. Am I quoting correctly? Sell your garments and buy swords to do what? Pear apples or bananas? What? To do what? What do you do with the swords? And then he goes to the garden of Gethsemane. He puts eight at the gate. He says, stay here and watch with me. Keep guard. What are they going to watch what? Then he takes with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. Goes further in. And he tells them, wait ye here while I go and pray yonder. Eight at the gate to do what? Three in a line of defense to do what? To watch what? Keep guard. Then when the Roman soldiers, the Jews brought the Roman soldiers, the tables were turned against him. But Peter, he had the sword. So he says, Master, shall we smite them with the sword? We, plural, more than two, more than one at least. Hmm? Did they have the swords with them? Shall we smite them with the sword? Did they have swords? Who instructed them to have swords? Jesus, to do what? Cutting apples? Pears? What? No, to kill people. But the tables are turned. So now he said, Peter already, he slashed off the ear of one of the, uh, one of the persons, you know, the guards. And Jesus now realizes that if it comes to the crunch, all will be massacred. So he says, put down your sword, because he who lives by the sword shall die by the sword. Didn't he know that when he told them to arm themselves? That he who lives by the sword shall die by the sword? Then why did he give them the wrong advice? No, it was a right advice, thinking that the Jews will come along, Jews against Jews, it might be a different type of a battle than compared to trained Roman soldiers. So now the tables are turned against him. So he says, put down your sword. So the sword is ever there in the hands of Jesus. At the temple he whipped the Jews, you remember? Whether with a whip you hit a man or with a sword, you are a violent person. You agree? Whether you hit a man with a blow, I'm violent. With a whip, I'm violent. If I have a sword, I chop off your head, I'm still violent. So Jesus Christ didn't spare anybody. The sword was there in his hand. If he had the opportunity, he would have done the job. You know, better than Muhammad could have ever done. Thank you very much.
in respect to the rule that we set early on and Mr. Dida's wishes, it's now 8.30. I apologize that you were the last man. I apologize to the people behind you. Just before you leave, I would like to uh, hand over to our chairman, Dr. Zaki. Uh, every meeting has to come to an end, and it, the, that duty falls to my sad lot this evening. It but remains to move a vote of thanks to the Speaker, Mr. Ahmed Didat, who has included us on his European tour, to the Islamic Propagation Centre for organising the meeting, and also to our hosts, the West Lon London Islamic Society, who helped us organise this meeting. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for that. I am sorry Ms. Mr. Didat won't be able to meet all of you this evening. He has left South Africa on the 16th of August, 16th of July, and he's been on the move ever since. He's rather tired and he has a long journey to Birmingham tonight. I apologize for that. Thank you for coming. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you.